Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. Uh, what is the story with adaptation and resilience at COP28? My name is Lucia Noel, and I'm a coastal resilience expert with Earth Journalism Network. Um, just a few quick uh, announcements for those of you who may be new to Earth Journalism Network or EJN. Uh, it has a mission to improve the quality and quantity of journalism on environmental topics. EJN does this by helping journalists around the world report on climate change, biodiversity, conservation, pollution, and other issues through grants, fellowships, and other kinds of support. EJN is also a community of more than 14,000 journalists across 180 countries. If you're not a member and you would like to be one, please go ahead and visit earthjournalism.net. Um, by registering, you'll be the first to hear about grants, fellowships, and webinars like the one today. Um, about today's webinar, uh, just a quick overview. In 2022, climate leaders um, and negotiators reached a landmark decision during the 27th conference of the parties last year in Egypt. Uh, after years of debate, higher income countries uh, finally agreed to contribute to a loss and damage fund that would help low income countries grapple with the negative impacts of climate disasters. Uh, that story and many others will continue to play out um, in highly contested debates this year uh, in Dubai at COP28. Uh, many experts still say there's something missing from this conversation, and that is adaptation. Uh, we know that marine and coastal ecosystems provide vital services to coastal communities. Um, so while the world debates mitigation and nat nationally determined contributions, local communities are already grappling with the losses of these services and ecosystems. So today we're talking about how can journalists at COP28 or around the world better cover adaptation stories, um, adaptation efforts, or the lack thereof. Today we are joined um, by two speakers, uh, but we will have a little bit of a different format today. We're gonna hear from Yusuf Jamil, um, an associate scientist at Project Drawdown and Aruna Chandrasekhar, uh, a climate journalist at Carbon Brief. Rather than sort of two separate presentations, our speakers will have um, more of a dialogue about their work around climate adaptation. And through this conversation, it will help demonstrate how a journalist might interview an expert on these topics. Um, for their quick bios, uh, Aruna is a climate journalist at Carbon Brief. She holds a Master's of Science in Environmental Change and Management from the University of Oxford and has previously worked as a freelance journalist for a variety of publications, including New York Times, Guardian, Scroll, and Caravan. Uh, Yusuf is a multidisciplinary scientist with experience in water resources, public health, data analytics, and science communication. He is passionate about his expertise in research, data mining, and analytical capabilities to find solutions to climate change. He holds a PhD from the University of Utah. Uh, and just two final announcements. Uh, number one, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, you will be able to rewatch on our website and um, that will be available over the next few days. All registered attendees will receive an email notification with that link when it's ready. Um, following the presentations, we will be opening it up to audience questions. For those of you who are here watching us live right now, uh, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen to put your um, questions in there at any time. We will be monitoring the Q&A and reading those out at the end of their presentations, um, but we are not monitoring the chat for questions. So please make sure if you have a question to put it in the Q&A. Um, we will now hear first from Aruna. So um, over to you, Aruna. Thanks so much, Lucy, and thanks to everyone who's tuned in. I hear that we have an astounding number of participants who've signed up for this, and a lot of them from the Global South. Uh, so I'm super excited uh, both to take you through a bit of my process, and I don't know how much uh, you've read up on what's going to happen at on adaptation at COP28 or how to, what are the big issues that you should be looking out for? And these are things that we're trying to compile in a list of, you know, who wants what at COP28 and which countries are particularly pushing for what on the agenda. Um, but I think it's it's a really, really important year going by all of the submissions uh, where countries are looking to sign off on a framework on the global goal on ad adaptation, which is called the GGA. Um, just to tell you a bit about myself, I mean, my first COP was COP23, and I was a fellow um, who came in knowing none of the politics, none of the policies, to a degree knew of um, and understood the climate justice element of it. But also, I grew up in... Um, a coastal city 
called Vishakapatnam, which is on India's east coast, and that is um, extremely vulnerable and keeps getting hit by hurricanes as well as cyclones. We are also looking at a lot of coastal erosion in the area. So this is sort of the this is the city that I grew up in, and so to me, coastal issues and issues around adaptation and resilience are incredibly important because of year on year looking at you know impacts that are growing and the sort of space that water that sea level rise that um, adaptation is given and afforded in climate conversations now so far the focus has very largely been on mitigation and you know dealing with what we call the root cause of the problem and looking at fossil fuels and deforestation where a large amount of my work is focused but at carbon brief i cover a range of different things from the stories at the intersection of food, of land, and nature, which also includes water. It also includes an element of mitigation as well. Um, yeah, in I realize that there are lots of many first time either uh, cop goers or journalists who are trying to cover these issues and looking at where to start, or how do you speak to climate scientists on the daily. Um, well, while I have also been covering climate science for a while, um, it's also helpful to know that many journalists might also just be uh, starting off uh, afresh and not, not necessarily knowing where to begin. Um, but I mean, it's a common starting point. And for all of us, even who've been on this beat for a long time, trying to find experts, trying to speak to them and get them to both open up and also talk to and speak to climate realities that we are witnessing both in, across the world, especially in the global south and especially in coastal areas, um, and to be able to get their takes and use them for our stories and um, both speak to policy. Um, these are often things that are challenging, but just to assure you, a bunch of stuff that you can do while looking for sources. So for one, um, I use my hack is to, I'm an extremely online person. Um, I use Twitter and X a lot. Um, also use LinkedIn, also use Instagram, but Twitter and LinkedIn can be both great sources, sources and to find uh, climate scientists who are speaking out on issues. So uh, you can search for adaptation or look for previous cops and see who's um, active on the issues that you're looking at, whether that's geography, or whether that's the particular issues that you are speaking to, um, and see and try and line up. There's also people who curate lists. Uh, Catherine Hayhoe does this very useful list of uh, compiling uh, climate scientist accounts and um, scientists who do climate, and that is a really useful set of sources as well. Um, you could also look at something that at Carbon Brief that we call the Global South Climate Database. Now, this was something that realizing that, you know, we often end up relying on the same sources over and over to speak to issues uh, that confront us. And very often, you know, uh, climate science has its own sort of biases. So here scientists self-report, they put down the issues they're interested in their national origin, what they speak to, um, area of expertise, and you can try and find uh, global South scientists on these particular issues who um, might be willing to speak to you with their emails as well as contacts. So that's one particular way. And for Yusuf, of course, I looked him up on LinkedIn. I looked up his previous work, use Google News, um, and run a search on the people who you are trying to quote and see what they've said before. Um, I also find it useful to look at IPCC reports, get an idea of the science, uh, Carbon Brief also does really good summaries of previous COPs as well as IPCC reports and what they have to say on adaptation, on coastal ecosystems and threats by climate change. Uh, so all of that is particularly useful while prepping for this. And it doesn't have to be days ahead. This is something that you can put together. In, and this is how I prepared for this interview. So yeah, uh, looking forward to chatting with you soon. Thank you, Aruna. It's very helpful to understand sort of how you would prepare for a discussion. Um, over to Yusuf for a presentation on your work. Thanks, Aruna. Thanks, Lucien. And thanks to Earth Journalism Network for giving me this opportunity. Uh, and, you know, I totally echo with what Aruna said, you know, last year was my first COP. And if you are a newbie to COP, it's very challenging to really understand what to follow. There is so much going on and there is so much to learn and participate in. So I have briefly made a slide uh, to really look at what are the key topics that we could talk about in this COP or we should keep an eye on this COP. So I'll share my screen. Uh, 
And uh, let's look at some of the key topics that we could, uh, can you all see my screen? Yes, I can see it, thank you. Okay. Perfect. Uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, what to watch for at COP28, uh, you know, but before I begin into that, I really want to take a moment, you know, to remember Dr. Selim ul -Haq, who passed away last month, you know, he was one of the most well-known climate scientists uh, and leading voice for low and middle-income countries in climate negotiations, an outspoken advocate of climate justice, who has done more than anyone to advance science and policy on climate adaptation and one of the leading figures in moving forward the conversation on loss and damage one you know he has inspired many individuals including me uh, i was lucky enough to meet him uh, last year at cop 27 and had a quick chat with him on adaptation and how we can address climate development and resilience together you know, I attended several sessions on loss and damage uh, that he chaired and saw in real time how that effort really took place and how there was a movement to keep the G77 countries together to really make sure that last year at COP27, you know, the loss and damage fund was actually passed. So not surprisingly, you know, one of the key topics to watch out you this year Sorry, excuse me, your um, slides actually still say loading right now. Maybe if you could try to share your screen again. Oh, oh my bad. Let me see. Uh, can you see now? Yes, I see that. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Um, that, yeah, so this was a slide I prepared to give a tribute to Dr. Huck. So let's move to the next slide. Uh, and <clears throat> yes, uh, one of the key moment at COP27 was the breakthrough agreement to provide loss and damage, you know, and uh, this will be a key topic to watch out at this COP uh, and briefly, you know, it is a mechanism that low and middle income countries have been demanding for a very, very long time to address the adverse impact of climate change. It is designed to provide financial assistance to these nations to help them cope up and recover from losses and damages from climate extreme that they are not responsible for. You know, at COP27, the, uh, the governments agreed to establish a transitional committee to make recommendations that would be uh, adopted at COP28. So uh, what were these, uh, uh, you know, what was the transitional committee and what did they recommend? So the transitional committee included 24 countries, 14 low and middle income countries and 10 high income countries and met several times this year. And there was really a deadlock between them and they were failing to reach a consensus until earlier this month. And really the main idea where they were not agreeing was who will host the loss and damage fund, which nations will be eligible to apply for it and who should pay in the for the fund, you know, uh, earlier this month on November 4, they reached a consensus. Uh, a lot of low and middle income countries were not really happy, but I guess this was how the consensus was reached. And the first thing was that the fund will be voluntary. It will not be mandatory, you know, and that's a big ask, uh, you know, that was not fulfilled. The low and middle income countries wanted it to be a mandatory fund, uh, but turns out that right now at least it is voluntary. The other thing is the fund will be housed at World Bank. You know, one of the key asks was again that there are separate UN entity that was established similar to GCF that will fund or that will house the loss and damage fund. But at least for now, it will be housed at the World Bank. And people who are aware with the World Bank, you know, there are a lot of challenges associated with housing a fund that is needed urgently, you know, right after a climate event can be problematic. And finally, there is a push from countries like the US to really make sure that other countries like China, Saudi Arabia, or United Arab Emirates, who were classified as developing countries in 1992 when the UNFCCC was adopted, they're not developing anymore. They're per capita GDP is very high, their economy is big. So they also pay into the fund. 
it is likely that the loss and damage one will be operationalized at COP28, even though uh, not to the liking or not to the extent that many countries would have wanted, but at least it's a good first step to begin with. The main thing that all eyes will be on this COP will be the global stock which is a crucial process within the UNFCCC that assess the collective progress that countries have made in addressing climate change. It involves a comprehensive review of countries' emission reductions, adaptation effort, and climate finance contribution, helping to inform future climate actions and international commitment to limit climate change. You know, after going through several thousand documents that were submitted by governments, by uh, civil societies and by businesses, the key finding is that we are not on track on addressing climate change. And this is not surprising. Right now, we are on a track to warm somewhere between 2.4 to 2.8 degrees Celsius. So we really need a systems transformation, you know, to course correct to limit ourselves to well below two degrees Celsius of warming. One of the key points that came out uh, uh, from this global uh, stock take technical committee was that we need a systems transformation to really address climate and development together, especially in low and middle income countries. And the other aspect was global emissions need to peak before 2030. So there is an urgent need to increase finance uh, especially, you know, adaptation efforts that are locally informed and, you know, to fund this low carbon development in low and middle income countries that really increases resilience. So the global stock take is a moment of reckoning that we are nowhere close to meeting our Paris Agreement. Nations are not cutting their emissions fast enough, especially high income countries. And, you know, low and middle income countries are not prepared to deal with climate events and they do not have enough funds to meet their climate goals. Yet we do have a narrow window of opportunity to limit warming, to limit the damages that climate change will cause. So there will be many competing efforts uh, at the global stock take. High income countries will push to end fossil fuel. There will be a pushback from low and middle income countries to stop or to at least, uh, you know, not end completely fossil fuel. Uh, there will be leaders in climate negotiations who will make bold commitments and big decisions on issues like, you know, should we phase out or should we phase down? There will be a huge debate around financing climate resilience in vulnerable nations and transforming the ways countries produce food and uh, energy. So these three topics within the uh, within the global stock take is something that will be very important, looking out, phasing out versus phasing down of fossil fuels, how we manage our food systems, and you know, from where do we get our climate finance, how we increase climate finance. And that really bring me to look at what is the current stage of climate finance. There is no climate action without climate finance. And although climate finance has really increased in the last couple of years, it is several times lower than what is required to meet the climate goals. You know, this is a figure I got from Climate Policy Initiative that was just published a few uh, last month. Uh, and the average climate finance has reached about $1.3 trillion in 2021-2022, which is doubled from what it was in 2019 and 2020. Yet it is several times lower than what is required. First, I want to highlight that only 5% of the total climate finance is grants. Increasing national debt for low and middle income countries has slowed down climate action considerably. And it is clear that debt forgiveness or giving grants instead of loan may be one of the most crucial solution <clears throat> that could make uh, climate interventions possible in these countries. Yet what we are seeing is that grants are almost non-existent in climate landscape. So this is something that uh, low and middle income countries will push for, that there are more grants and less loans. Similarly, uh, you know, and as pertinent to the topic, there will be a huge challenge association with adaptation. Only about 5% of the finance again went to adaptation. 
The fact is that adaptation efforts are seriously underfunded. About $63 billion went to adaptation, and that includes high-income countries also. And the adaptation cost, according to the UN Adaptation Gap Report that came out recently, is estimated to be between $215 to $387 billion annually this decade. And much of this $63 billion that is shown in this figure is actually used in high-income countries, suggesting that investments in low- and middle-income countries is very, very low, about 10 to 15 times lower than what is required. And another issue is that adaptation finance is really dominated by public actors. About 98% of the total money is coming from public, uh, uh, public sectors and not from private sectors. It is worth mentioning that people in least developed countries and small island nations are often more exposed to climate hazards and more likely to be killed by climate-related dis disaster. And this is despite the fact that they bear very little responsibility for causing climate change. So there will be a huge push again from many, many countries to increase funding for adaptation and which should be the case as we can see that the funding for climate adaptation is just so, so low. And one last thing that I want to point out again is that food, agriculture, you know, land use sector accounts for about 22% of global emissions yet the funding it receives is so, so low. And food system solutions are really important. Why? Because they not only improve uh, uh, food security, but they also address mitigation, they also address adaptation, and they also contribute to resilience. Imagine when you are restoring a farmland, you are not only contributing to mitigation, but you're also contributing to increasing the resilience and adapting that area, that region to climate change. Similarly, when you're restoring a mangrove forest, you're not only sequestering more carbon dioxide into the soil, but you're also increasing the resilience of that community of that region to a rising sea level, to more hurricanes. So uh, with that, you know, I would like to end my presentation and I would like you know, all the new people who are going to COP who might not be aware that these three topics, you should keep your eye on loss and damage, uh, global stock take, and you know, where the climate finance is going. Uh, and with that, I will stop sharing my screen uh, and back to you, Lucien. Thank you so much, Yusuf. There's a lot of great information and story ideas there. We're going to um, open it up now to have a bit of a dialogue conversation between Yusuf and Aruna. Um, so I will go ahead and pass the, pass the mic. Thanks so much, Lucien. And thank you, Yusuf, for a great presentation and an, a bird's eye view of uh, the issues that are at stake and at, okay, uh, at COP28 and what we should be looking out for. But just to rewind a little, um, Yusuf, how did you get involved in climate work? Um, because your work seems so interdisciplinary um, and covers a lot of ground and covers a lot of ground between, you know, looking at water, looking at urban solutions. Um, so how did you get involved in climate work? Were there influences early on? Um, now that this has somehow become it's such, a, such a major part of what you do at uh, climate at Project Drawdown is on climate solutions. So it'd be amazing if you could trace some of your journey for us. Yeah, no, thank you so much for that question. And I think there are multiple aspects that played into the role where I am right now. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, I was always interested in the earth and the climate that led me to really pursue my undergrads in earth sciences. And, and water is something that I think has always fascinated me because life originated in water and water in some ways is life, you know. Water, access to water is also a fundamental human right, you know. So I was always fascinated by water and I wanted to pursue my, my career understanding water systems, you know, how water cycle plays out. At that point, really climate was something that I knew about, but my focus was really on water. And suddenly, you know, as I was pursuing my grad studies, I realized like, oh, wow, climate change is really impacting the water cycle. It's not only about temperature. It's not only about 
that the concentration of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases are rising in the atmosphere. You know, there are so much more that's happening. Climate change is, change is impacting our health through heat stress, you know, through wildfires, through, uh, through uh, hurricanes. You know, so many people are dying. So many people have different, you know, uh, health impacts. It is impacting our crop system. It is impacting our food security. You know, with every degree rise in the temperature, you know, the agricultural yield is predicted to go down by five to ten percent. You know, same with the water cycle. Climate change is really supercharging the water cycle. A lot of regions will in experience in huge increase in precipitation, as we saw in Pakistan last year. That led to about maybe I'm wrong with the exact number, about 2,000 people died and millions were di displaced, you know, and many regions and including where I live in Utah will face aridification. There is a constant decline uh, in long-term trend in rainfall in the Colorado River Basin in the Western US and in areas uh, uh, in North Africa, in Southern Africa, in, in parts of Australia. So it's such a complicated uh, uh, an interconnected topic and water is central to it. Less drought, drought means less water, flood means more water. In all these cases, water plays a very important role in how climate change is impacting our lives. And I think that's uh, one of the reason why, you know, uh, water is such a fascinating topic to look at, uh, you know, when we look at the impacts of climate change. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah. That, that on that note is why do you think then that water doesn't receive quite the amount of attention that energy does um especially in the climate conversation which is kind of tied into this conversation between mitigation and adaptation like given that so much whether that's desertification whether it's drought the floods in pakistan or droughts in the panama which are now bringing global trade to its knees or in cities like Chennai or even Dubai, where COP is going to be held. Of course, sea level rise is something that, you know, that especially that you've had uh, small island states um, talking about um, and, and especially championing 1.5. Um, but there's also issues of like, you know, hydropower being so many states relying on that as part of non-fossil energy. It, it's connected to mitigation as well. So how is it that water gets as little attention as it does? Yeah, I mean, there are there are many reasons. And I think uh, the, the first and the most important reasons is really the dialogue has focused so much on mitigation that, okay, we have to reach 1.5. What do we need to do? We need to rapidly reduce greenhouse gas emissions, which is very important. I don't want to take that away. It's extremely important. Uh, but water doesn't necessarily fit in directly in that narrative. You know, as same with the health, I would say, you know, there is so much health impact of climate change, but it has it hasn't received that kind of attention that the attention received from, you know, received by things focusing on mitigation. And again, I think the another challenge is there is a lot of innovation. There is a lot of research going on. How can we mitigate uh, climate change? What should we do? That hasn't been the case for water, you know. And lastly, which might not be the most important factor, but could play a role is that, you know, flood, drought, hurricane have been part and parcel of our lives throughout the history of mankind. Yes, they have become more intense. Yes, they have become more frequent. Yes, they are more damaging now. But human, mankind has known to live with these challenges you know so i think these three things really play a very important role in in you know why water has not received that kind of attention uh, and the good news at least from the water side of the thing is that it was highlighted at cop 27 you know like water is central to climate you know you cannot talk about climate without looking at water. So the latest IPCC report that has has two dedicated chapters really focusing a lot on the water cycle and why we should pay attention on water. And we had the water conference in March this year in New York that really brought together 
experts from across the world to look at why we should uh, include uh, water in climate dialogue. But like my fundamental take, and this is my opinion more, uh, you know, uh, why the focus on mitigation has been so strong and that the same logic cannot be applied to adaptation also. You know, the singular lens at which uh, climate change has been looked at through the mitigation lens has really put many other challenges that are equally important on the on the side. So I do think that things are changing right now. Uh, water is uh, being talked about much more. Uh, there are many, uh, you know, efforts, mostly on local scale, you know, where we are seeing efforts to, you know, adapt the, the, the agriculture system, uh, you know, improve the water conservation system where there is established signs that, water trend or the precipitation trend is decreasing over the years. Similarly, in regions where we expect more flooding, more hurricane, there is a need for, you know, urgent adaptive measures, urgent measures to increase the resilience of the communities there. Right. Um, and I think it's it's really important that also a lot of countries are highlighting this and they're tired of this especially adaptation being um, given a uh, sort of stepchild treatment or um, in uh, COP and other discussions. And we see this from a lot of the submissions in to the global stock take, which for our listeners is like a five yearly report card. And it's really vital because it's this is the first one. And this is going to be happening in a very, very crucial decade where, you know, the whether 1.5 is still within grasp, but it is a sort of stock taking and it is a report card on how countries have done on a bunch of things, which is mitigation on adaptation, as well as on loss and damage. Um, and in terms of, you know, the finance that has been provided or not provided. So countries are especially keen um, that this stock take takes note of adaptation so far um and you know the disproportionate sort of emphasis and but also what have what are those efforts that have been made now for instance um you know lecs the least developed countries uh, small island states that are you know at the, the, perhaps the most disproportionately affected by some of these impacts are especially keen to see um adaptation finance be doubled it was a promise that was made at glasgow uh, developed countries promise to do this. We are seeing a lot of um, countries coalesce around this and say that this is something that they support. Um, but at the same time, we've seen rich countries asking uh, uh, countries to provide more information on climate finance and adaptation effectiveness, essentially saying that, well, we've given you this money. Um, can you show us how this has been spent and how it has not been spent on maladaptation, which is, um, and asking that be detailed in the stock take. Now, um, Yusuf, to you, how do you see these sort of both tensions take place and how do we both have a strong um, and uh, outcome on the global stock take that can course correct this implementation of adaptation efforts and you know to try and deal with and live with climate change, which is something which, we do uh, in the global south respective yeah 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 i mean this is this is something that will be followed in real time by many many people what's happening you know and again i would not be surprised at all to see a huge push from high income countries that show us what you have done with whatever money we have given you even if it is way below what we have promised you know stop using fossil fuel you know there is this push from many high income countries. But I think, you know, what really is needed from low and middle income countries is to really stick together as a block and keep demanding, you know, there is an urgent need to highlight that climate change impacts low and middle income countries the most. They didn't contribute to it. They are the most vulnerable to it, you know. And I think sticking to this, this idea is very important. 43,000 people died in Somalia last year because of the drought that many experts argue was due to climate change or was exacerbated due to climate change. We see record level of flooding in so many different countries and same with drought, same with hurricane, typhoon, cyclones. Climate change impact in real time is real 
in many low and middle income countries. It's devastating economies and they are not being able to recover from it. So what I really want to see from low and middle income countries is to push back, you know, and this goes also on loss and damage, push back and demand for, you know, more ambitious agreement on adaptation, you know, sticking to what they have already agreed upon and maybe even doubling that effort, you know, there should be, you know, uh, there should be a framework, though, in my opinion, you know, that looks at robust and establishes quantitative and qualitative targets when it comes to adaptation to keep the dialogue going both ways. I think that's also important. You know, if if there is a lot more finance coming in, there will be a report card that would be asked. But, you know, before that report card is being asked, at least provide the material to do it, you know. And finally, you know, you know, the financial aspect is so, so important. And I really think, you know, there has to be a very uh, concerted effort to get, you know, a lot of increase, multifold increase in the in the finances. As I was showing, it's 10 to 15 times lower. And I would rather argue that it should not be loans. These countries are actually being impacted by climate change. You know, they are in no position to pay the additional interest. A lot of this money should be in the form of grants, you know, that really help them to recover from the damages, the impact that climate uh, is doing on, on the economy and on the people, on the culture of these countries. So I really hope, you know, at the end of a stock take, there's a renewed push that adaptation takes a central stage along with mitigation and the finance that we're putting into adaptation really is double, triple, or even more, the more, the better. And a lot of that money comes in the form of grant. That's my hope. Let's see what happens. Uh, these negotiations are very, very challenging and, uh, uh, and, and, and only on the last day we'll know what, what really happened. And I mean, some of these things are going to be very, very, very down to the wire. Um, and as, but we saw that. And I was there at COP27 until, you know, the gavel went down at somewhere around eight or nine in the morning uh, when we were running in overtime. But especially, you know, how things changed and turned on uh, loss and damage and the fund, which was surprising. I'm glad that Salim Bhai was around to see that. Um, but of course, we have seen how this has progressed, and you've uh, detailed this as well a bit in your slide. Uh, so from going to a decision that a lot of developing countries were hopeful about, to now uh, both seeing a degree of outrage in terms of uh, where the fund is housed, um, but more importantly, the definition of vulnerability, which is always something which was, you know, in, in under question now, whether, you know, a country that was chairing G77, which is Pakistan or India um, or Pakistan will be eligible to uh, access funds under the loss and damage fund. Will countries be able to have direct access to these funds? Um, and at the same time, you know, who contributes uh, and at the same time, who is going to be able to, to benefit from it? What And according to you, Yusuf, uh, what form should the fund ideally take that could best serve the needs of vulnerable coastal communities um, and especially given the mixture of rapid onset as well as slow onset events right you've got I mean you might have sea level rise you might have floods you might have drought which is a lot longer uh, and you know a slow moving process how do you make sure that countries have access to this over and above what they have in terms of humanitarian assistance and otherwise, um, yeah. Uh, no, I mean, that's a very, very good question and, and a challenging one too. And uh, I would uh, put, I put together some points and uh, I think yesterday I read a paper that was co-authored by Dr. Huck himself that came out in Nature, you know, probably one of his last paper, and where he laid out some of the steps that could be taken to really make this loss and damage fund more accessible, you know, and really serve its purpose. So, you know, the first and foremost thing is, you know, I personally and a lot of low and middle income countries are not happy with the way the fund is right now housed at the World Bank, you know. 
World Bank still funds some fossil fuel projects. It will take a fees. It has a lot of bureaucratic, uh, you know, baggage that might take months or even years to get these funds out. And really loss and damage fund should be something that's very quickly and easily accessible. Even when we look at the, the Green Climate Fund that is housed separately in the UNFCCC, it takes a lot of time to get a project approved. So yes, Ideally, you know, this funds should be bank uh, should be housed in a separate UNF Triple C entity. But the one of the core principle of loss and damage is easy and quick accessibility. You know, if there is a flood, if there is a hurricane, if there is a need right now to do cash transfer, it has to be done in days and weeks, not months and years. You know, and the other key point is that it should be accessible to everyone, not just government. You know, not just big organization, but also cities and community groups. Generally, these are the ones that comes first to help people out. Local communities know well what their problems are, how they have been impacted, and how they can do, uh, how they can provide a solution. So they should be part of that dialogue. You know, a small amount of money, fifty thousand to hundred thousand dollars, should be made easily accessible on a pilot scale to these organizations that are work, uh, working locally. Thirdly, you know, the funding should not be based upon how much more money can it bring or how much more money can it generate, you know. It should be really focused on how much people it benefits. And I think that requires a fundamental, you know, 180 degree turn in how we view to use these funds. It's not about, you know, the returns. It's not about, you know, the economic gains you have made. It's about how many lives you have saved and how many lives you have helped. This has to change. There has to be a paradigm shift in how these funds are used, you know. And again, the 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 board, you know, on which uh, uh, loss and damage fund is used has to be very broad, you know. Make a lot of communities make a lot of countries, especially low and middle income countries, eligible to these funds. You know, yes, India is a middle income country for now, and even by some measures, Pakistan would not qualify. Uh, you know, uh, for these funds, but that's not the case. These countries are really suffering, and they should, or at least communities in these countries who are suffering greatly from climate change should be able to access uh, the fund. And finally, when it comes to who should contribute, I'm all in. I personally favor countries like Saudi Arabia or UAE or China should contribute to these funds. Uh, we need more and more money. You know, it is going to run in trillions of dollars, you know. So the more uh, the countries contribute, the better it is. But that should not really take the burden off of high income countries that because we have new players so you know what we'll not do our part i think there has to be a balance and you know every player should do their fair share uh, you know and that's how we'll reach uh, justice and that's how the loss and damage could really you know uh, fulfill its purpose Thank you, Yusuf. Thank you, Aruna. Uh, we're going to switch and open it up to some audience questions. So as a reminder, anyone listening to this live, if you want to put your questions into the Q&A and I will read them out. Um, we have two questions that I'm hoping we could answer um, sort of together around the role of social unrest, uh, geopolitical uncertainty and war in climate governance. Um, the question is, how does turmoil affect the global uh, climate governance and the fight to cut emissions? Um, perhaps Yusuf, if you want to take this first, and then we could go to Aruna. Yeah, I mean these are these are all really uh, interconnected topics, you know, and uh, and you know, God forbid, if something really bad happens right now, and you know, the war really expands to many countries, climate will take the back seat. Unfortunately, uh, this is the sad reality uh, of this world that even climate change affects each and every one of us you know many many times it just takes the backseat because the short term uh, goal or the short term impact or the short term you know problem really takes the front seat so uh, yes uh, you know war uh, or any conflict can really push back you know uh, 
climate efforts, but it can also enhance climate effect, you know, uh, or climate uh, efforts. Uh, we saw last year <clears throat> during the Ukraine Russia war, like, you know, when the natural gas was being very difficult uh, for the Western European countries to access, you know, yes, they changed uh, the source instead of buying much of their gases from Russia, they started buying from other countries like Qatar. But they also really invested a lot in green energies. In many countries, we saw that the investment in solar, in high, in, in 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 wind, really increased. So uh, it's 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 a very again complicated topic and interrelated, and really depends upon where the conflict is happening, how big it is, how long it is. Uh, but it can have uh, uh, you know multiple uh, impacts. You know, as as I just showed you two cases you know where in like europe there was a push towards more greener uh, uh, you know solutions just because it made them more autonomous it made them more less dependent on other countries yeah um as someone coming in from a journalism perspective i think um it's quite loaded um because at one end we are looking at you know the point of working on climate change is also to, to prevent loss of life, um, to help communities adapt. And a lot of that just gets uh, erased um, by, especially by by war, by turmoil. But of course it has uh, vast ramifications, most of all for affected communities. And, you know, I mean, you can forget about climate when you're dealing with bombing um, or, but, we we are looking at things in terms of how it impacts global supply chains, especially like last year, while Yusuf was talking about um, the war in Ukraine uh, and uh, necessitating shifts away from natural gas. It also meant countries were looking for other sources. Um, it also meant um, people and and countries that are dependent on um, these uh, nations for their wheat as well as sunflower and other food imports that are already food insecure uh, were facing these um the rise in, in food prices and commodity prices and you know the the poor having to deal with that over and above being in places that are conflict hit so you have that exacerbating what's happening over and about it also makes tensions that much more rife and we're going to see how that unfolds at cop 28 now which is um where a different blocks rise and and you know how this is perceived by different nations in terms of what is your respect for international law um and how is this being perceived in terms of one conflict versus the other could be the sort of and we're seeing some of those um statements sort of being made by uh, leaders on different sides so yeah global turmoil has a but then there is the other aspect which is well is it spurring countries to think more about their food security is it spurring them to start thinking about you know the idea of green developmental states um at the same time we're we're talking about trade wars and cold wars and that sense where you've got uh, manufacturing sort of trying to be shored into certain areas and conditions but at the same time um, people in countries are calling for international cooperation and for sanctions to be put down so that the global energy transition can happen so yeah um, different sides of you different ways and um, all of it has an impact so there's no point sort of thinking of you know conflict and climate in separate silos when they seep into each other in various ways um, yeah and impact each other and I think maybe working towards that it, it's going to be uh, quite a charged uh, atmosphere at COP and to see how this plays out. Absolutely thank you both. Um, another question uh, perhaps for Yusuf um, the question is the reports are indicating that we are not meeting the um, designated 1.5 degrees limit. Um, do you have any expectation going into COP28 that they will be maintained or changed at all? Uh, by change, like, do you think we'll set the goalpost higher? I, I mean, uh, I don't think so. I think uh, <clears throat> that 1.5, uh, you know, and well below 2 degrees C is there to be around. Whether we meet them or not is a totally different question, but I don't think that will change. We'll still stick around 
to those numbers. Yes, we have already warmed by 1.2 Celsius. Uh, by now, we really have a very, very small budget left to stick, uh, you know, to 1.5 uh, uh, degrees Celsius. But I really think that the push will be really to, uh, to really make sure that we course correct. Right now, we are on this trajectory. We really need to change trajectory rap rapidly, you know, uh, to to stay well below 2C. Uh, I mean, 1.5 is almost unrealistic right now, if I can say that. Uh, but 1.6 is not. We can still stay at 1.6. And believe me, 1.6 is much better than 2 or 2.4. So I think... I think there will be a huge, huge push right now uh, to really limit as much as we can. 1.5 is ideal, but if we reach 1.6, it's not the most ideal, but still better than 2.2 and 2.4. So there will be a huge push to cut down on fossil fuels and high income countries should really rein in on this. They should really cut down on their own <clears throat> Uh, 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 you know, fossil fuel uh, uh, usage. Uh, you know, the second will be there will be a huge push again on food system. We know that food food system is responsible for about twenty two percent of global emissions, and methane, which is which is a short term climate pollutant, really increases the warming in short term. A lot of it comes from you know from the food system, and again, that needs to be uh, taken care of. And again, more from high income countries, you know, because a lot of food is wasted, you know, about one third of the total food that is produced is wasted. And the reason I'm pushing on high income countries, because in low income countries, food is not wasted, food is lost. And what I mean by food is lost, there is not enough infrastructure that when a farmer, when they produce a food, you know, they can sell to the market or they can store in a cold storage. So we need to address both these issues. And we'll see all this really culminate in the NDCs, the national determined contribution that each country submits to uh, you know to the UNFCCC in lieu of the Paris Agreement, and there will be a huge huge push to really enhance the NDC when they will be submitted again in 2025. You know to make sure that we have you know solutions, we have actions that can really help us you know reach that goal of well below 2C. And uh, my guess is. Uh, in many, again, high income countries, that push will be really, you know, to rapidly cut down on fossil fuel. Uh, and in many low and income, low and middle income countries, it will be to, you know, transform their food system, uh, you know, uh, not address development and climate change in silos, but rather integrate them together. You know, when we are doing development, they are done in a green way. And I think that's the way to go. So uh, yes, uh, it is getting late, but it's still possible and we can reach that. And that will be seen through an enhanced effort in improving the NDCs. Thank you. Um, another question maybe for Aruna, um, for those of us trying to track the flow of finance, climate finance, what is the best source? Um, there are often so many numbers that are thrown around, it's hard to understand what is credible. That's a really good question. And, you know, it's also interesting because there are lots of different estimates as well as studies, uh, which go towards looking at various sources. Like right now, um, what people are looking at is the UNEP adaptation report. And I think the adaptation gap report, which is tracking various sources of uh, climate finance right now, which um, is super, super useful and helpful. The OECD publishes numbers um, on climate finance that is provided from rich nations and the others. So these are two sources that we uh, typically take a look at. Um, as well as some government data. So I'm guessing that should be fairly useful in terms of determining um, yeah, where you track climate finance flows. Thank you. Um, and perhaps last question is, um, we can open it up to both of you. The question is around setting measurable goals for adaptation. Besides the amount of finance, what can be sort of a measurable goal uh, for climate adaptation?
uh, yeah, I mean, it is, it is, it is a tough question. It's also a very local question. You know, what are we adapting for, and 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 how can we reach, uh, you know, those adaptation goals? I think, I think, uh, and again, a uh, uh, few things that come to my mind is uh, a uh, that it really improves. Uh, or the or increase the resilience of people you know when we are talking about adaptation you know we need to set up a goal how it is improving the lives of the local community i think that is something that's very fundamental you know uh, when we talk about, about adaptation and two it involves you know local communities local people and three it should not be maladaptation we have seen some cases globally where uh, you know that uh, adaptation efforts have led to more damages you know than actually helping the local communities you know building a wall might not be the best idea you know in fact building or restoring local wetlands might be a much better idea so i mean uh, my 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 take to this question is really you know that the goals uh, will be varying from region to region and what we are adapting for are we adapting to protect a community from a natural extreme event? Are we adapting a community that is increasingly facing drought? And how can we adapt the local agriculture? Are we adapting, uh, you know, a community, uh, you know, that is facing extreme heat stress, an urban community for communities living in cities like, uh, you know, uh, like Mumbai or Dhaka, you know? So I think these goals should be very localized and and you know the fundamental aspect should be really to improve the well-being of the people and to make sure that future you know uh, climate events or the impacts of climate really minimizes those damages on these people on the communities yeah absolutely thank you um we have just about three minutes left aruna if you want to add anything to that um answer or if you have any final thoughts that you'd like to share um with everyone yeah, adaptation metrics, everyone sort of thinks of things very much in a mitigation frame of mind where you can, you know, put down gigatons of CO2, where you can talk about, you know, particular units um, tied to things, um, various different targets as well as pledges. With adaptation, it's a lot more complicated. You're not going to get a sort of a simple answer and be able to put that. And it's something that... Um, countries will have to determine whether that's you know how how are you going to measure if countries are better adapted to the impacts that they're seeing and you know kind of numbers to that but one question that i think was also addressed here is um how do we educate the public to accept media messages on climate change was one that was raised by udo um, Akpan. I think one of those things, especially, I don't know, I, mean, I think this is a, it's a contrast both for many years, we would see this as a difference between global north and south, where, you know, in the global north, and we've seen Reuters research as well on the fact that climate denialism is more of a northern problem, right? For very, for very long, it was until the impact started growing year on year, we would see, and we've been seeing bigger wildfires, we've been seeing floods in Germany, um, and to a point where, you know, denial is, doesn't have as much of the supercharging as you thought it did. Um, in the global south, we've been living with impacts for as long that it's, uh, denial is not a question, it is, uh, climate change is a lived experience, but at the same time, you know, there is this question of, now it's big, we've reached a point where policymakers are quite quick to attribute an event to climate change before an extreme weather event to this before uh, looking at, you know, failures either to adapt or to deal with um, serious infrastructural uh, problems when it comes to dealing with it. And I think um, in this dealing with um, public on either side um, and sort of putting these messages out. Now, there are different schools of thought. Um, some believe that we need to be, and I'm sure Yusuf is very much from that school of um, talking about climate solutions uh, and very much in the school of the adaptation part of things that, okay, well, how do we adapt to this? How do we live with this? What are the solutions? Where do we 
make these sort of installs um and that often sort of looks at the idea of that you know, shouldn't uh, portray this with as much um doom or gloom but at the same time it is kind of scary out there and it also the fear also does um motivate people to act um you know it's a, it's a question of whether you know it's that delicate balance of like okay well are people do you provide them enough information enough data for them to act um and as well as human stories to show that sort of change is possible and those who are acting um or you know um sort of and and those are questions that journalists grapple every day um but i think the enormity of the challenge um and the enormity of what is coming and the effort that's necessary but also the fact that there is a window um within which to act and to be able to hold both states accountable um for big emitters including companies and to be able to ask them that and put those questions out, I think is still the responsibility of media. So I think there's a mix and I think I encourage um, journalists going to COP28 to explore a bit of both, which is holding polluters accountable, that element of it, looking at this divide between North and South. And also, you know, um, I'm sure you will do a bunch of different stories, both around solutions, as well as looking at the problem. So um, I believe a mix of all is is healthy and you know um but yeah i think one of the, the most important things is to really to break down both the silence the science the policy um we do that at carbon brief and try to also like break down the jargon uh because there's a lot of that um so we try to explain some of that and make that accessible to y'all um but yeah i think we have a minute left in use Thank you so much. Thanks, Aruna. Yes, we are uh, a minute past our time. So I just wanted to quickly say that um, we will be sending around uh, the recording as well as the slides and any contact information or resources uh, to anyone who is registered. Um, we also do have a feedback survey, which I think our tech team will place into the chat um, if you'd like to provide any feedback. Um, apologies that we didn't get to everyone's question, um, but we do have the slides and the contact info and recording that will be coming to you via email. Um, and I just wanted to, as a closer, pass it over to Yusuf for any uh, final thoughts or or anything that's giving you hope heading into COP28. Yeah, I mean, I would just like to add one more point to Aruna's such a great answer she gave to uh, to 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 uh, <clears throat> Udo's question. I think one point that I would like to add, Udo, if you could uh, tell stories, people really connect with stories, you know tell local stories, the challenges people are facing with or due to climate change. And I think that makes a huge impact. You know, at Project Drawdown, where I work, we have a huge focus on telling stories. And I think it makes a big impact on the audience. When they see a fellow human being telling how climate has impacted them, it makes a huge, uh, you know, you know, it, it, it human beings are so connected to stories that it impacts them in positive ways. So, uh, you know, just wanted to add that point. And to close in, I'm really, really thankful uh, to have this opportunity to speak uh, to you all. So thank you, Lucien. Thank you, Aruna. Thank you, Hannah, for uh, organizing it. And I'm hopeful. I'm really hopeful <clears throat> that at this COP, uh, there will be some good, you know, push towards actual climate actions to limit warming to well below 2C and also to really help low and middle income countries to meet their climate goals, be it mitigation goals, be it adaptation goals and be it loss and damage uh, fund to help them, you know, uh, address the impacts of climate change. So with that, you know, I thank you all and I pass it to Aruna maybe. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you too. And echoing what Yusuf says, um, I try and keep people at the center of storytelling and connect, you know, the person most affected to national, global and international policy um, and science, but always with a focus on, you know, people impacted and um, both with them with agency, with dignity, um, and also keeping in mind and reminding ourselves that, uh, you know, we were able to get last year's income because uh, the last, last year's outcome um, or uh, because there were uh, people fighting and activists making their voices known and young people doing that and people 
you know, we're pushing their leaders to acknowledge that we're facing this and we would like to see action on this. So it's not that none of that is being heard or felt. And I think countries are under pressure and governments are under pressure to do something, to say something. So I hope for that. Thank you so much, Lucy. And thank you so much, EJ. And this has been so great. Maria as well. Um, yeah, over to you, Lucy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Yusuf. Thank you, Aruna. And thank you to everyone for joining. That is our time for today. So I uh, will um, close here. Uh, thank you. Have a, a great morning or evening wherever you are in the world. Thanks, everyone.